Welcome students, uh, Film History Part 2. Let's get started. So, um, film represents this country's greatest force for evil and debauchery. Words to live by. Um, as that quote suggests, as we moved into the 1900s, um, film became a, a divisive element in society. And uh, if nothing else, the fear that motion pictures would ruin the country's morals spoke to the power and influence of film. That's how much people are realizing that film is powerful. So, um, now, when we talked last, uh, Edison had his kinetoscope parlors. He was uh, making a good living off of those. Um, but in 1910, 19, Nickelodeons were attracting two, uh, 26 million people. Uh, five years later, that number had doubled to over 50 million people per week. 50 million viewers at the Nickelodeons per week. Pretty amazing. The popularity attracted the attention of big companies that saw the potential, the profit potential. Edison's being one of them. So, um, what Edison attempted to do was to create a monopoly, to cut out the competition and sew all those profits up for himself in this country. He created what's called the MPPC, the Motion Picture Patents Company. He put together people like his buddies uh, um, Goodwin and uh, Eastman and tried to um, make all of their inventions very exclusive and proprietary and didn't share them with anybody so he could control the film business in the United States. Um, now, what came out of that was independent production. Uh, in Europe, with Millet, uh, in France, uh, well, with Millet and with uh, the uh, uh, Lumiere brothers, in other countries and on the West Coast. Because if people are going to try and control the, the industry in one place, people are going to go someplace else to compete. So that's what happened. Um, not affiliated film companies uh, competed at their own risk. MPPC people raided the independent studios, equipment was smashed, and employees were threatened. They were very serious about this. This is big money. Their strong arm tactics aside, the MPPC did establish standards and create an international motion picture industry. So, in spite of the fact that they are strong arming the independents, they are creating standards that we still used up until just a couple of years ago when we went digital. Among the other things that MPPC did to hold on to control and profits was to forbid the use of actors' names in film credits. They thought that if actors' names got out there, the actors would want more money. <laughs> well, of course they would. Uh, it was assumed that if audience became familiar with the leading characters, that the actors would achieve star status and demand more than the minimal wage that they were getting paid at the particular time. In 1915, one of the most important films in the history of motion pictures was, rele was released, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Um, and a re revised version of Birth of a Nation was released a couple of years ago, shot here in Savannah um, and on the, the uh, plantation down in Richmond Hill, uh, where we have the opportunity to shoot if we ever need to. The three-hour film was made to commemorate the 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary, think about that, of the Civil War. And uh, it cost less than $110,000 to make, but it earned more than $18 million in profits. Everybody knew at that point, film was a profit generator. Now, even though Birth of a Nation represented a quantum leap in film techniques because of its race, but because of its racist theme, it was very controversial. Uh, the film was said to have a flawed sentimental attachment to the Old South. Griffith was from the South. Among other things, violent anti-Negro Ku Klux Klan members emerged as heroes. And uh, it was uh, responsible for a rise in Klan membership back in that, in that time. The showing of the film uh, resulted in race riots in major cities and inspired the rebirth of the KKK in the South. If there was any doubt about the influence of this new medium, the issue was settled with Birth of a Nation. Even today, some colleges that plan to screen the film have met with major opposition. Um, 
I've I've watched it. It's tough to watch. It's three hours long, but um, you know it's of the time, and you have to realize that those were different times. Doesn't make it acceptable. Doesn't make mean that people should ever go back to that. But it was of the time, and you have, if you look at it in that context, it's bearable to watch even at three hours. Griffith's second film, Intolerance, had a message of love, tolerance, and the futility of war. It cost twi twice, 20 times as much to produce as Birth of a Nation, and it was a financial flop. It was the first flop. Not only was it ahead of its time in terms of techniques, but people didn't want to hear a message about tolerance, especially when we were getting prepared to go into World War I. Now, films were originally shot on the east coast of the United States. And many films were shot outside to compensate for the slow speed of the film stock in those days. So more light meant that your film would look better, and so people shot outdoors. Um, the weather back east often didn't cooperate, but out west, you've got nice days most every day. Um, and wide open spaces for making films. Not to mention a very big ocean and lots of mountains. So... Uh, it was only natural that independent producers look to the West to start making films to try and compete with the MPPC, which had a stranglehold on the East. Now, uh, they moved to Hollywood. Hollywood was nothing at the time. It, it wasn't a neighborhood. Um, in fact, it was, you know, mostly orchards. And, uh, you know, apple and, and, and oranges. And uh, that's where you get the, the term apple box, is because all those films were being shot in orchards. And so, uh, you know, grab me that apple box, let's make this actor taller. Uh, once the independent film companies were established in California, though, they started turning out films that were as good or better than the films being created by the MPPC. Now, um, Hollywood was named by a real estate agent who moved to the Los Angeles area from the East Coast and brought with him a bunch of holly trees. Holly trees don't grow very well in California. Um, he wasn't a botanist. He didn't know that climate was that different in California. Um, he thought he would introduce a new species of trees. They all died. But he called his neighborhood Hollywood Land. Hollywood Land... Um, I don't know if the letters fell down or if uh, what happened, but it was shortened ultimately to Hollywood. So it was named for that development that didn't really catch on. Now, he still named the area Hollywood Land, put up a large sign on the side of the mountain to advertise the area. Later, it was shortened. Holly trees or no holly trees, the area ended up being an ideal site for early motion pictures. Now, while the MPPC didn't want to list the names of the actors in their films, the independent studios on the West Coast embraced the idea of having actors draw public to watch their movies. Um, one of the first actors to be promoted this way was Florence Lawrence, the first famous actress. Bet you didn't even know the name Florence Lawrence. Now, that fact would draw audiences away from the rival MPPC. It didn't go without being noticed. They realized that that was going to happen. Um, and it led to hard feelings for between the two for years to come. Two other well-known names from the early era are Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart, and Charlie Chaplin, the little tramp. And um, ultimately, Chaplin and uh, Pickford and Pickford's husband, um, joined together to create United Artists, which was around for years and years and years. United Artists being one of the original uh, studios in Hollywood. Now, if you walk along the Hollywood Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard, uh, you'll see their names engraved on the bronze stars embedded in the sidewalk. They're just two of scores of film, radio, and TV notable spanning almost a century of history are commemorated on the Walk of Fame. If you've never seen it, it's worth seeing. Uh, very touristy, but it's still fun. Now, do the names Harold Lloyd, Ben Turpin, and Buster Keaton ring a bell? If 
they do, then you've seen some old comedies, some old black and white silent comedies. Uh, this is Harold Lloyd. Millions of U.S. immigrants and people around the world who didn't speak English um, could still enjoy their physical humor. Physical humor being lots of slapstick and falling down and stuff like that. The first 20th century superstar was Charlie Chaplin, and he was the un disputed comic genius of silent comedy. He started out making 150 a week, and by 1917, he was earning more than a million dollars a year, which is huge money in the time. His character was first displayed in the film The Tramp, where he played a, a baggy-pants vagabond with a bowler hat. And, by the way, the mustache preceded Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler copied him. Uh, there were more than just simple humor in his work. Chaplin used his films to convey messages about good and evil in society, and especially the disparity between the rich and poor. Hmm. Although Chaplin's work was very popular, some rich people didn't appreciate his pointing out the social problems of the early 1900s. Sometime later, now we're going to take a little side trip here. Sometime later, the perceived threat of communism would loom in the United States, and Senator Joseph McCarthy would capitalize on this fear by initiating a communist witch hunt, referred to as the McCarthy hearings. Chaplin, who was born in Britain, was one of McCarthy's targets. Um, now, Chaplin's films, you know, um, did not paint rich people or politicians in the brightest light, let's say. The threat of communism was real. Communist infiltration had reached high levels in the U.S. government. Uh, but after months of investigations and the outlay of huge sums of money by the U.S. government, no communist plot was exposed by the hearings and many lives were ruined in the process. Many people who attended the meetings out of curiosity, never dreaming that they could also become be named as communists. And just being there would land them in jail or spell the end of their professional career. Sometimes they went to support some of their friends who were being accused of being communists without any real cause. The fear of communism was so great that the individual freedoms on which the U.S. was founded were pushed aside with impunity. The, uh, we lost a lot of our civil liberties through this hoax, through this red scare, they called it. McCarthy aimed his investigation at people in the film business, and everyone feared they might be suddenly be branded by a, a communist or a communist sympathizer, which was almost as bad. How did you spot a communist? Are you ready for this? Consider this description. Communist writers can be spotted because they portray bankers and senators as villainous characters. Hmm. I'm going to leave that out there. Studio heads were upset because they felt that writers and actors were getting too much power. So during the hearings, a Warner Brothers executive said that when film writers made fun of America's politics, they were engaging in communist propaganda. He, other, uh, he further stated that movies sympathetic to Indians and the colored folks were also suspect. Can you believe this? Warner Brothers, right? That's been around forever. We'll talk more about them next time. But pretty surprising that the studios would side with McCarthy. Now, why? There's a real good reason why. Some famous members of the film community that were under attack ended up being branded by uh, the Hollywood Ten. This group of nine screenwriters and one director were singled out and subpoenaed. On a matter of principle, they refused to answer questions about their political views. All ten were uh, imprisoned, and some were fined up to $10,000, which, again, was a lot of money at the time. Studio heads, fearing economic consequences of using people tainted by the hearings, blacklisted 21, uh, I'm sorry, 214 of Hollywood's most talented people. As a result, these people could not work in the industry for more than a decade. Um, one of the blacklisted writers wrote a script under a pseudonym, a false name, that won an Academy Award. He couldn't go claim it because he would be arrested. So, um, it, was a, it was a really evil time in our, in our history. Eventually, Edward R. Murrow, if that name isn't familiar, it should be, because he changed the, the, the trajectory of this country. Uh, he was a newsman, a CBS radio and TV newscaster, did a TV documentary on the McCarthy-led paranoia. Even though this resulted in Murrow's being put at the top of McCarthy's communist enemy list, um, his expose, 
tellingly revealed in McCarthy's own recorded words, marked the beginning of the end for the senator. This was the beginning of the end of the McCarthy era. So, it takes one man speaking out against ignorance to sometimes turn the tide, and that was able to do it. Now, it wasn't until 20 years after McCarthy hearings that Charlie Chaplin, by then one of the recognized greatest uh, film talents of the 20th century, returned to the U.S. to re receive an honorary Oscar at the Academy Awards celebration. Um, there's a clip uh, that, that I put a link in this uh, worksheet this week. If you want to watch that, it's pretty impressive. Chaplin received one of the longest standing ovations in the history of the Academy Awards. Now, realize that the studios went along with the McCarthy paranoia because they wanted to, an excuse to cut out some of the people that they were paying great sums of money to. This is greed. This is unbridled greed, and it's what is at the root of a lot of the evil in this country. That's it for this one. See you next time.